the live q and I'm, I'm happy to be back. I was traveling last week. So please give me a thumbs up to let me know everything is working. And while I wait for that, um, uh, just a couple of, of things before we get started. Um, spent the week riding bikes in Vermont. Lovely state. Uh, beautiful. It was e-bikes, so we were kind of biking. It was a lot of fun. Um, thanks for the thumbs up. Beautiful. Uh, we went, one place we went in Burlington was on the uh, causeway, which goes out, it used to be a railroad. And like many abandoned railroads in the United States, there's a federal, I don't know if this used the federal statute, but in any event, they convert a lot of them to trails because the easements are already there. Uh, and so you can bike out on this thing. So you're biking on this, this path and it's, you know, it's not very wide. I mean, the path is maybe like this. There's rocks going down, but you're, you have water. This is in, on the Lake Champlain. So you have water on both sides. Absolutely gorgeous. Highly recommend it. And e-bikes are fun. Actually, we were on a, uh, at one point, we were on a Trek Verve Plus 2. And it was a decent workout. You certainly had uh, the, the, the assist to help you get up hills and stuff. Uh, but, you know, we went, I think, 26 miles the first day. A um, lot of fun. So I've got that. Um, I'm reading an excellent, excellent book that's kind of related to the topic that we're going to start the show on. That's kind of where to invest our cash. Invest is probably the wrong word because it's not, I don't, you, you really can't invest. When you put money in like a treasury bill, I don't, I don't really view that as investing. We'll, we'll get to that. But in any event, uh, 21st Century Monetary Policy by uh, former Fed Chair Ben Bernanke. It's, I'm only... 30 pages in. It is excellent. Extremely well written. Uh, very easy to understand. Uh, and, and it's the kind of book where you get through, you know, man, I, I've learned a lot. Uh, fascinating. And it, it starts with sort of a historical perspective. For example, he talks about how the link between currency and gold is probably a pretty significant cause of the Great Depression. Which I, if I've ever read that connection before, I'd forgotten about it. And this idea of what's sort of the ideal employment level, you want to get employment, ideally, you want it as low as you can get it without triggering inflation. Well, what is that number? And it changes, it turns out, over time, uh, which is uh, particularly important today. The other interesting thing, like you went back into the Nixon administration and uh, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, uh, you know, when they were fighting inflation, when you're fighting inflation, you have to do, if you're going to fight it properly, you have to do some very unpopular things, not just with monetary uh, policy, where like, you know, like the Fed's doing now, raising rates, but even fiscal policy. Like one of the things to do is to raise taxes. But very importantly, don't use that money to further stimulate the economy. So don't, don't use it for like programs that are going to pump more money back into the economy. I guess you could use it to pay down debt. I can't fathom our government, at least currently, or maybe ever would, I mean, it's a very unpopular thing to do. People are already struggling. The, the, the natural thing to do is what California and other states are doing. And that's sending out stimulus checks. But of course, it's the absolute wrong thing to do to fight inflation. In any event, great book, highly recommend it. I've put a link below the video. You can check it out on Amazon. It's where I got my copy, but, or you can go to the library, I guess, check it out for free. Great book. All right. So before I get to your questions, and I've already seen some great ones, uh, I wanted to sort of Talk about where you might put cash. I don't call it investing because you're, you know, you're, you're going to earn a below inflation rate return right at the moment, <laughs> significantly below inflation. Uh, but obviously, we need emergency funds. You may have money that you're, you know, you're saving for an, ex, you know, an expense in the next year or two or whatever. And I had some great questions that were sent in to me. I'm going to read a couple of them. This one came in, uh, and I, I realized I don't have the person's name. It was in an email, but I'm, I'm looking at it in my note app. Great question. He says, they were watching risk re the Risk Reversal podcast. I'm not sure what that is. But in any event, they were convinced to buy a two-year treasury. This is a you know, U.S. government bond that matures in two years. And the time they, they bought it, it was yielding 2.44. So, you know, you hold it for two years, you, you, you get 2.44 yield along the way, and then you get your money back. They pointed out, though, that now, and this was the time of the email, the two-year uh, had gone up pretty quickly, and it was at 313. 3. 
So that's uh, what, 60, 70 basis points. He says, uh, how do you know when a rate has topped out or bottomed? That's his first question. And the answer is you don't. There's no way to know. Uh, we can certainly look at things. The Fed, you know, going to raise rates this week, presumably. The consensus is 75 basis points. Exactly how that affects the bond market, though. It's not like it's, you know, they raise it by 75 basis points and every bond and every you know, credit instrument goes up by the same amount. It just doesn't work that way. But you, you don't know. This, some believe they do know. I've yet to meet anyone who consistently does know. Uh, and certainly I don't invest based on some belief that I know how interest rates are going to move tomorrow, let alone next month, next year. So I don't think you do know. Uh, and I can imagine scenarios where rates keep going up throughout the year. I can imagine scenarios where they sort of level off, maybe even go down a bit, right? So I don't know. But here was where I thought things got interesting. What should I do now to get the best return? Do I sell the, two, the, the bond at 2.44, eat my losses, I'll explain that in a minute, for a higher rate? So I guess sell, sell the 244 bond and go buy, the, the two year now is around 3%, but we'll just use his number 313. Sell the 244, go buy the 313. Doesn't seem like a bad way to go, I guess, right? Just hold on to what I have until I have a positive return on my current treasuries. Um, well, I don't, you, that may never happen, <laughs> right? Or do something else. So here's the deal. Um, when you buy a two-year treasury, this would be true of any bond. And, and Well, it's important to, uh, to keep in mind that with a treasury, we assume there's no risk of default, right? With a corporate bond, a different government bond, that you know, risk of default can play a, a big role in the value of the bond. So for example, I was looking at MicroStrategy bonds. That's the company Michael Saylor runs. He's, it's basically a Bitcoin ETF now, as far as I'm, I can tell. And I think the last time I looked, their bonds were selling at 51 cents on the dollar. And that was based on the market's view of credit risk. And there's probably some, certainly there's some, some interest rate risk in that bond as, as well, but there's always, almost always an interest rate risk, I think. I'm trying to think if there's ever not interest rate risk. In any event, with treasuries, no risk of default, right? And so when you buy this, he bought the, the bond yielding 244, two year term. Uh, he can sell it now, let's say prevailing rates are 313. Let's say you buy it on day one, the next day rates just jump from 244 to 313. No matter what you do, keep the bond or sell the 244 and put the money in a 313 bond. I don't think your results over that two-year period will change. Or it, it, mathematically, if they did change at all, it would, I think it would be insignificant. Anyone in the chat disagrees, let me know. But let me explain why. When you sell a 244 bond, when current rates are paying 313, as we've just discussed before, you're gonna have to discount that bond. Let's say it's a $1,000 bond. No one's gonna give you $1,000 for it. They'll just put their $1,000 in a new 313 bond. Why would they give you $1,000 for a 244 bond, right? Doesn't make any sense. All right. How much are you going to have to discount the bond by? So what am I going to get for it? Well, it's going to have to be enough so that when you factor in the 244, or really the interest rate uh, on the bond, and whatever discount you have to give them, it works out to the current yield, 313. So let's just assume you discount it to, I don't know, $960. I'm just making up a number. You could sell it. You take a loss. You get your 960. You go put it into 313, hold it for two years. And the, and the net effect of that won't be 313, right? Because you've, you've sold it a loss. You've lost whatever the amount is. So if you, if you do all, crunch all the numbers, what do you end up with? Well, 244, I mean, more or less. And by the way, it's true as well. If rates went down, let's say rates went down, you could sell at a premium. So well, maybe I'll lock in my gains and reinvest it at that lower yield, but that's okay. I've got these gains. Sure, but now you're getting a lower yield and it ends up coming out to the original yield you invested in to begin with. Now, I'm not a bond trader. Maybe there's a real live bond trader watching the show. Maybe they can add some nuance to this. But the net effect is, in my view, I, I, I see no purpose. There could be some tax, maybe, to take a loss, maybe tax benefits that you may get this year and push some 
some interest gains in the next year. I, so, but if we ignore taxes, you know, I, I don't see an advantage. I mean, there'd be one thing if you wanted to sell the bond because you want to do something totally different with your money. The other thing that can happen, that, oh, this isn't the question he asked me. Let's imagine he bought that bond two years at 244. And let's imagine interest rates didn't change. And let's imagine a one-year bond was at 2%. Just again, making up numbers. And he held his 244 two-year bond for a year. Now what is it? Well, it's a one-year bond. I mean, it started out as a two-year bond, but one year has elapsed. So it's got a one-year maturity left. Interest rates haven't changed. So the one year, if you went out and bought a fresh, brand new 52-week treasury bill, let's just assume it's 2%, but his one-year bond is 244. So he could actually sell that at a premium. Now, a premium wouldn't be that much. I don't know. Again, it's all math ma mathematics, all numbers. You calculate it. But he would sell it at a premium. Because again, the, the going rate was 2% for a one-year bond. And he's got this 244 bond that, again, started as two years, but now there's only one year left on it. It's effectively a one-year bond. So he could sell it at a premium, take that money, and put it back into a new two-year two bond. And in fact, a, a lot of funds will do that. Again, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't know the mechanics of how they do this at all. Um, but that is a common strategy. Of course, that's not the question he asked me. So it, my take, if I were in his situation, apart from maybe some tax considerations, I, I you know, I, I, I don't know that selling it and buying the 313 bond is going to help you. That's my opinion. Now, I had a related question. This came from uh, Phil. Phil said, um, said the latest 13-week uh, uh, Treasury bill and 26-week Treasury bill were, and this is a couple of days old, but 215 and 276, 2.15, 2.76. He says, I don't see any benefit in a CD. And he was specifically talking about that Sally May CD that I've mentioned. It's a no penalty, a 14 month CD, it's still paying 220. And he had some other things in there. And I had a back and forth with him. Um, but there's a big difference, actually, a big difference. So uh, just like in the first, uh, yeah, email that I read, you can buy a treasury bill, 13 week, 26 week, you know, uh, 52 week. Um, and they may be good investments and I'm actually looking at them, but they're significantly different than a no penalty CD. Why? Well, as we saw in the first email, if rates go up, the value of that bond goes down. Now you can choose not to sell, but you're, you're still getting a lower yield than the current market. Again, assuming rates go up. And if you do sell, as we know, rate, rates haven't gone up, you're going to sell at a discount. With a no penalty CD, there's no discounting. If you put 10,000 in and uh, the Fed raises rates this week and you know next week you can get 250 instead of 220, you sell the CD, you get your full amount back, right? Uh, these aren't traded on the secondary market, at least the CDs we're talking about, other, other CDs are. Uh, and actually we'll talk about that in a second. You can get your 10 grand or whatever you invested in the CD and put it into the 250, the higher amount. Um, now that doesn't, again, that doesn't make CDs better than say treasury bills because, for, well, first of all, we're talking specifically about a no penalty CD, number one, but number two, what if rates go, go down, right? Well, you could say, okay, I'm locked in on my CD, that's good. With a bond, you might have a premium and it may make sense to sell at some point and get actually more than you put in, depends. So I don't think the outcome of all of this isn't that one is necessarily better than the other, at least in my view. I think they're both reasonable approaches to cash. I was looking at the treasury bill rates right now. Um, so the two year, by the way, is about 3% as of, you know, I guess today, this is on the US Department of Treasury website. Uh, but if we look at treasury bills, like the 13 right now is at 250, 260. Uh, here's what I'm looking at, by the way. So the Treasury, the the the, the 13 week here is at 260. I'm looking at the coupon equivalent, 260. So meaning that means the, the, so Treasury bills are zero coupon bonds, right? They don't actually pay interest in the in the in the sense of you get an interest payment every every month or quarter or half a year. You, you buy at a discount and you get your quote unquote interest when the when the when the bill matures and you get a, a, an amount greater than what you paid. And in, in any event. 
what they're doing here is calculating uh, the coupon equivalent so that you can compare these rates to a treasury uh, um, note or bond that does pay interest. I hope that makes sense. In any event, doesn't matter. 260. What's the 26 week? Uh, 304. It's interesting, like here, 308. Which one is better? This is a good example. Here's a 26 week um, uh, treasury bill, 304. Uh, and here's 52 week, 308. Which one's better? Well, you might think, well, wait a minute. I guess I'll go with the 26 week because I, because I have to, you know, I lock my money in for a shorter period of time. Of course, it's a, a treasury bill. You can only sell, but remember, rates go up, you lose, you sell a loss. But here I'm only quote unquote stuck, if you will, for 26 weeks. Uh, and here I don't get much more and I'm stuck for a year. Well, what if rates go down? <laughs> you get this yield for the entire year. But in 26 weeks, if yields go down, you got to reinvest this after half a year. So, you know, it, it all just depends on which way rates go. And we don't know that. So we can just do the best we can do on the information we have. In a rising rate environment, you want to be on the low end generally, the, right? The low end of the yield curve, meaning shorter terms, generally. And if the rates are falling, generally, hey, give me the 30 year bond. If I know rates were going to drop 2%, whatever, in the next six months, Boy, 30-year bond, probably probably be pretty good. Um, so uh, I think it's, I guess the takeaway for me is uh, when I think about these issues is it's important for me to understand what, what I know and what I don't know. And I need to, I need to embrace what I don't know and accept it. I don't know what interest rates are going to do. Some people make a gamble on it. It's generally not my approach. Um, so I'll probably move into the 13 or 26 week is my guess for some of our money. Um, that we're going to need in the next mm, see, well, 26 to 52 weeks. So part of, a, part of my, my thinking is when I'll need the money. But I, I probably won't sell no matter what happens. The other nice thing, by the way, uh, no state income tax. Now, you may live in a state that doesn't pay, doesn't charge, uh, have income tax. But if you have income tax uh, on, on gov U.S. government bonds, there's no state and local income tax. So that's a bonus. All right. Whew. Is it 8.30 yet? No. All right. Um, by the way, I've been, we, my wife and I have been watching all, what, what, all the murders in the building. What's it called? I, can, I can't remember the name of this thing. All Murders in the Building, which I guess came out a year ago. I think they're on the second season. Steve Martin, uh, Martin Short. Um, it's, it's not a laugh out loud kind of show. But it's, it's funny, and I like it. It's quirky. I don't know. I just like to tell you what I'm watching. I'm not really sure why. All right, question from Conscience. He says, I'm listening to The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins. I know I know him well. We, uh, I would say I shouldn't say well. I know him. We were on the phone a few months ago. Anyway, I wanted your opinion on his perspective of international coverage being found organically in VTSAX. Do you think we need more? So I read his book, when it came out, I, I don't remember what his take was on international exposure. I mean, I can assume from the, the question that he said, we don't need international exposure. And he certainly would not be alone in that. I mean, Jack Bogle was of that view. Warren Buffett, when he talked about his how he's instructed the trustees to invest uh, for, for his wife when he passes, you know, it was all basically all S&P 500, a little bit of treasury bonds. Um, and the theory behind it is um, that even, say, in the S&P 500 or in the case uh, total market kind of fund, you're dealing with companies that operate globally. That's certainly true for the larger companies. I was reading, but it's true for smaller ones. I was looking at AVUV, the Avantis Small Cap Value Fund, trying to do some more research. And I was looking at some of their companies and um, that they invest in. One of them was Triton International. And I read their 10K or skimmed it. And they're basically a shipping, well, intermodal container, but shipping, railroad, trucking sort of container company. And they do business, you know, it's a, a small company by public company standards. They do business everywhere, all over the world. Um, and so the thought being, if I've got VTSAX, then, um, yeah, the companies are all, all headquartered here. But that's actually a good thing. We've got great regulations here, at least relative to many other countries. Um, you know. We have great education here. 
you know, it's it's a good place, you know, to headquarter comp headquarter a company, and we get the the international exposure, and I get that. I, I can't say that I, I you know I don't think that's a bad approach. I have personally felt that more direct exposure to international is best, um, best for me, I should say, because uh, the reality is countries can go through extended periods of time of of underperformance. Do, you know, I'm not suggesting the U.S. will do that, but at the same time, I just don't believe that any country remains the dominant economic force forever, and that and the change will happen very, 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 very slowly until the end, when it will happen very, very, very quickly. <laughs> I don't know when that'll be. Maybe it's 100 years from now. I don't need to worry about it. But um, I'm perfectly content owning. You know, I've got I don't know 20 percent of international exposure, something like that. And I'm comfortable with that, but I can't, you know, I don't think the uh, jail's approach is wrong or bad. Yeah, I'm not comfortable with it. So that's the answer to that. Now I got to go back up to the regular chat here and see where I am. So this is a good question from Paul. What do you think of the TSBG fund um, for cash? So um, I've not, I've not honestly taken a deep dive into the G. I mean, I've looked at it in the past. It's been a while. So it's a, it is the G stands for government securities. Um, I'll pull this up. Here it is. Um, but I don't know that. The question I have is what this thing actually invests in. Here we go. So, so in other words, I think this is just an interest rate fund. And I think, because here it says it's calculated by the US Treasury as the weighted average yield of approximately 181 US Treasury securities on the last day of the previous month. So, um, you know, I think as a cat, certain it's gonna be secure, uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna earn much, but they do have um, is it the F fund? It is a fixed income fund. So that would be the comparison, I think, within the TSP. Those would be the two because um, the C fund is um, I thought the C fund. Okay, let's see. S is small cap, right? Yeah, S is small cap. I is international. Yeah, and C is is it is it like an S and P five hundred? I don't actually probably maybe. I'm guessing it's S&P, but it could be total market. I'm not sure. So I don't know. But in terms of cash, it would be G or F. And I think F is more like an actual bond fund. Let's go to composition here. Oh, yeah, it tracks the Bloomberg. There we go. That's the B&D. That's the same thing. The, I mean, there may be small differences because there can be different versions of, of the Bloomberg. I don't know. Bloomberg U.S. aggregate bond. I think it's like a B&D. Um, it's lost 10.05% percent this year oh, that's as of june so um well that's one year yeah 10.08 as of june so um i suppose if you wanted if you wanted to maybe avoid the interest rate risk although there, there could be interest rate risk in the g fund but it looks to me like it's more stable um from what i'm just looking at here but long term, like, you know, if you look at like the 10 years out, it's 197. You go to the F fund, it's going to be higher than that. It's got to be. No, it's not. Interesting. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's not it's not a bad fund. I mean, but it's, you know, you're not going to make much. Right. But that there you go. That's cash. Yeah. Paul, I have no idea if that was helpful. Probably not. All right, what else we got? Jim, your stupid questions are more than welcome. I'm going to ask all kinds of stupid questions. Should I sell everything and buy gold? Did you do you subscribe to my newsletter? Um, there's a link to it below the video. One of the things I don't do, so some newsletters, they basically just send you links to all of the content that the news, the, the person buying the newsletter has written. And I don't do that. I, I do put links to the videos and I will occasionally put a link to my articles, 
But um, the vast, 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 vast majority of the links are to articles I found on the internet. I probably read and review, skim, maybe 100 articles for each newsletter and pick mm, five to six of them. And uh, the reason I bring this up is because last week there was one on gold. And it, and, and, and it basically just showed, particularly for us focused on US dollars, how, what a terrible investment it is. And how it's, you know, the whole claim that it hedges inflation, well, it's fallen on its face this year. So there you go, Jim. That's my answer. Welcome to the show. He's probably going to sign out and never come back. Or he may continue asking stupid questions. I hope he does. Yeah, so Peter, um, it's a great question. It says, if looking to establish a trust to shield family from paying uh, for a possible long-term medical issue, are, are there look-back periods that would disqualify the benefit? Yeah, you need to talk to a lawyer. And shielding them from what? Like if you're shielding things from Medicaid, maybe? I don't know. Then there are definitely rules to follow. And there are, are lawyers and financial advisors that... that Specialize in that. Now, I don't know. Maybe you're not thinking Medicaid, um, but yeah, you really need to talk to someone. You need you need to talk to a pro. All right. Oh, well, I miss I missed you too. By the way, speaking of missing you, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna have a show next week. <laughs> There's a slim chance we could, but probably not. All right. Having a hard time considering investing in VXUS because of the countries of the countries. Long history of cooking the books. What country? You know about China? I'm not sure what country you're talking about because VXUS, we can pull it up. We've looked at it before. It's an international fund. Um, and here it is. And uh, if we look at the portfolio, you can look, by the way, for any international fund, you want to know what countries it invests in. Put the ticker in Morningstar, go to the portfolio tab, and then shoot down here. Here's the trick. You won't see it at first. You got to remember they've got these like sub menus here. We got to go to country and there's China, 10%. I don't know which country you're actually referring to. I don't think it's in there, unless I've missed it. Um, but that's a choice each of us have to make. I mean, you can get around that, not with VXUS, but you could. I don't know if there's any sort of uh, total international without China. There might be. Um, otherwise, you're starting to have to move into multiple funds to avoid certain things. And you could certainly do that. It's just I've, I've got, I, I don't, I don't do that. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't. All right. <laughs> this is an interesting question. Buffett sold Verizon recently after holding it for not too long. Why is he such a bad investor? I'm not really sure how to how to answer that question. And the the thing the thing about but I will I will say this. Particularly if you're looking at individual stocks, I think it's a great idea to get investing ideas from, from investors that you respect. For me, that would include Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, um, a, a lot of the value in investors. Um, Howard Marks, um, who else? There are certain investors that sort of um, focus on value, which is my approach. But here's the thing. Just because they've invested in something, you got to keep in mind, uh, one, they're often wrong. It's just that's like a, it's like you know Babe Ruth, he struck out, right? Well, great investors, you know, strike out sometimes. They may have bought it a while ago at a much better price. You may look at their portfolio today, and, and they might even themselves say, "I love my companies, but he, I wouldn't currently invest in seven of them. They're too expensive today." You probably will never know if they have any short positions. Those aren't in 13F filings. At least I don't believe they are. Um, 
So, uh, and you have to have a conviction because if you can't keep an investment through a prolonged, prolonged downturn for that company, then you really shouldn't be investing in individual stocks. Now, in the case of Verizon, I don't know. Um, I don't even know if it was Buffett that bought it, right? He has others that manage quite a bit of their money. Noreen did not make it to Woodstock. Um, but it was, it was Lake Champlain is amazing. And what was the other one? Is it Lake George? Am I just making that up? I think it's south of it, right? Gorgeous. Um, we, we were biking through the countryside, you know. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We did catch the heat wave in Vermont. It was brutal, but we survived. And we were staying in a home built like in 1870. Had no air conditioning. Woo! Getting too old for that nonsense. So um, I am, I did, thank you for that, Mike. I did catch part of that. Someone emailed me with it. Um, and I probably owe Paul um, an email, but here, here's what we're going to do. Paul, we're going to do it right now. Paul, viewers of my YouTube show are asking for you to come on as a guest. What do you say? Best Rob. Here we go. Done. We'll see what he says. All right. So, um, Sean, I emailed you a few days ago. Let me, let me stop there. So as I've told you, I read every email. Um, and and it, eventually I respond to every email. The response you're going to get is likely a template. plate. Now, I have to actually key in strokes that reproduces it, and then I send it to you. So this is not an automated thing. I'm actually sitting in front of your email, reading it, and then say, okay. And occasionally I'll add a PS or, you know, but, but it's like I'm getting three or 400 email a week, I would say. And that doesn't include great comments on the YouTube uh, video. So, you know, it's kind of just where I am right now. Um, I, I don't know of an alternative. I just can't, you know, keep up with that. So anyway, Sean says, I figured I'd check out your live stream. Welcome. Question, have you given Fundrise a good look? Performance looks good compared to REIT funds. Well, so I have. And I had um, Brandon Turner on. He's with Open Door Capital, which I think is kind of similar to Fundrise. Um, I've also looked at farmland. You know, there are companies that uh, Acre Traders won that allows you to invest in farmland. At the moment, I'm not personally going to invest in any of, of these. Um, and it's, it's not that I think they're bad, um, uh, because I don't. But the way, I don't know if, if this is true with Fundrise. I, I, maybe I should double check Fundrise. Here, here it is, by the way, so you can see what I'm looking at. The question I have here, here we go. Investments in Fundrise should be viewed as long-term, five-plus years. This is because nearly all of the most effective real estate investing strategies require a combination of blah, blah, blah. We select strategies based on their long-term return. How does, here, this is what I want to look at. While Fundrise should be viewed along to it, we understand blah, blah, blah. Accordingly, our investors may request redemption at any time, although such redemptions cannot be guaranteed. So I need to look into Fundrise. The, the question, here's what I'm trying to get at. You're probably like, Rob, he's, he's, he, Rob's lost it. What's going on? A lot of these will work where you put in an investment, you'll earn cash flow. Um, you may even get some, some tax deductions. Uh, and then uh, they sell the property five to seven years later. And then, you, you know, you get your money back and any additional returns. And I don't want that. I don't want to invest in real estate for five to seven years. Um, you know, I, own, I know folks that own farmland and it's been in the family for generations. That's the kind of investing I would want to do. But that kind of investing takes a lot more work. Now, I, I could do a self-directed IRA and all that and avoid the taxes. 
and, and do it in an, in an IRA. But I've just kind of, it's, it's one of those hurdles that I just don't want to deal with. You know, I'd rather make a YouTube video. <laughs> um, so, but now the, the thing I was looking at for Fundrise is, I don't know, maybe you can, maybe they don't liquidate your investment. I just can't remember with Fundrise. I know the farmland investments that I've looked at, including Acre Trader do, Open Door Capital does. Um, and that's my hang up right now. And I just haven't spent enough time to see maybe Fundrise, I'll have to dig into Fundrise. Um, or maybe someone knows, someone's invested in Fundrise. I don't want my investment liquidated in seven years. You know, I owned real estate, I don't anymore, but the, the real estate investments I did own, and I got out because it just, it wasn't working with the person I was investing with. Uh, he was doing most of the work and I got that. And so I sold him a couple of the properties. In any event, we were in them for, I guess, 13 years and would have been in them, in them much longer. Um, so in any event, that's my concern. Again, Fundrise may be different. I'll have to look into it. All right. VC wants to know which brokers are a good place for a self-employed retirement plan, like a SEP or simple IRA? Well, um, the first question that I would ask is what I want to invest in. You know, if it's low cost index funds, then, you know, any of them, just about any of them would be perfectly fine. I would say if I had to pick one, which you don't, but if I had to pick one for everything, probably Fidelity um, offers, I think their, their technology is great. Their, their, their website is great. Their apps are great. I've had a great um, experience with their customer service. They have great cash management for when you get to a point where you're pulling money out. Um, so, but, you know, Vanguard is, is fine. Schwab is good. Um, I think if you're, if you're gonna, ever going to be overseas, we learned from the Mark Zorl interview that probably Interactive Brokers is the best. So it does depend on what your specific circumstances are. But yeah. So right now, what small cap funds am I using? Right now I'm in VBR. Take a look at that. And I'm I'm there as a result of some tax loss harvesting several years ago. Um oh I'm no, I'm not in VBR. Uh hang on for a second. I'll tell you what I'm in. I was in VBR, which is Vanguard small cap value. Um, now the ticker from what I'm in, which escapes me at the moment, but I will tell you, I think. And, and VBR is, oh, I'm, in, I'm just in the, that's an ETF. Okay, here we go. I'm in the mutual fund and it's VSMAX. So it's just Vanguard's small cap index fund. Um, I probably wouldn't pick this if I were starting fresh today. I would pick small cap value. Uh, and I probably wouldn't pick VBR. And the reason I wouldn't, we looked at this in a, in a video on AVUV, which is Avantis's fund. The problem, not the problem, but the thing about Vanguard's small cap value, if you look at the portfolio, and we'll look at weights. It's not really a small cap fund. It's really more, I mean, I guess it's tilted more to small cap than mid cap, but it's really sort of a small slash mid cap. And it's not really a value fund. It's more of a value blend fund. And so I would be more inclined to find uh, a fund that really tilts more small cap and value. Avantis does this. I do have some, I mean, it is an actively managed fund, but I would put that in air quotes. I mean, I, I'm, from what I can tell, they're using some kind of automated analysis, at least to some degree, to pick their their companies. They're not. I don't think they're doing so. Sort of, well, I don't know. But just from the the way they're, if you look at the portfolio, the way it's constructed, um, I gotta believe that's the case. If you look at weights, there is some blend, but it's pretty heavy small cap value, almost no mid cap. And when you look at their portfolio. I don't know why this can't, this is not exactly 1%. By the way, I told you I was looking at Triton. That's why it was, it's their number one holding. If you actually go to Advantis's website, you'll get more finer 
allocation percentages, then Vanguard's just got one. That's not right. But but it's close. And and so this is not like a cap weighted index fund. It's more like an equal weight. But I don't. From what I can tell, they don't disclose in great detail how they do it. But I'm looking at this fund uh, not to replace the Vanguard fund, but I may put some of my money that I invest in individual stocks. Actually, I've considered putting it in this fund. Whether I'll do it or not, who knows? So Noreen wants more bonds. BND in my Roth or FXNAX in my IRA? Well, I don't know what FXNAX is, or if I did, I've forgotten. So let's first figure out what that is. What do we got? That can't be right, so let me try that again. FXNAX. Oh, it's Fidelity's bond. Um, I wonder what that tracks. Here it is. So, um, FXNAX, we're going to pull it up on Fidelity's website. It may track the same, the same thing. It's very cheap. Yeah, it's the Bloomberg Barclays U.S. Agri bonds. It's the same bond index. So um, my approach on bonds is to keep them, for the most part, um, in traditional retirement accounts. I don't want them in my Roth because, as I've said, I want my Roth accounts to, to get as fat as a tick. Um, and equities are going to do that over the long term. The reason I like them in traditional IRAs, one, you know, I, I, if I, it, it helps me with taxes if they're in a taxable account. Of course, yields have been really low, but they're going up, but it's taxable income. But also, if I'm going to have some investments that are uh, lower in expected returns over the long term, I'd rather have them in a traditional IRA so that my required minimum distributions are smaller. At least that's my thinking. Maybe there are other factors that are relevant that I'm just not smart enough to think of. That wouldn't surprise me. Rob, can you put the name of the Bernanke book in the comments? Well, it's below the video, and here it is. But yes, I think I can add my own comment. I don't, I don't comment very often. 21st century... Monetary. See, I'm a full service operation here. I mean, here, it's in the comments. Good book. Yeah. All right. We're we're getting a lot done. I don't know if we're heading in the right direction, but we're making good time. All right. I lost my place. It took me all the way to the bottom. I can I can't add comments anymore. That's out. Oh, but I found my place pretty quickly. Good. So um, he does need a mod, if not me, someone else. But thanks for the vote of confidence. Yes. So we're Noreen and I are working on that. I had to change. Yeah, we're talking. I had to change the day. My weeks. I always thought retirement would be slower. But yeah, we're working on a moderator, or maybe more than one. I'm not even sure exactly what the moderator should do, but I think they'll tell me. So why are we not talking about investing at the market discount? I wish I knew where to put my money right now. Well, first of all, what do you mean the market discount? What I don't know what, what the market discount is. And what's your investment plan? And that should tell you where to put your money. And I, that's what I, I just follow the plan always. There's never a bad time to follow the plan if it's a low cost sort of cover the market plan. I mean, you can tilt towards value or small cap if you like or whatever, but you've got your plan. You just follow it. I see other questions. Yes, Noreen and I are talking. I promise you, she is going to set me straight. And I'm grateful for that. And we're going to have some moderators or at least one, maybe more.
All right. Oh, in the in the newsletter, I mentioned I'm speaking at, or I'm on a panel during at the Bogleheads conference um, in October. There's still a few tickets left. I put the link in uh, the newsletter. So and so, what I'm thinking is, if folks come, we'll do a separate meetup. I don't know somewhere. Get lunch, dinner, coffee, something. All right. So this is about Save Better, which is where you get the Sally Mae No Penalty CD. And I agree here. If, if I were going to use Save Better, I would go with the Sally Mae. Right, right now, I'd go with the Sally Mae 14-month No Penalty CD. That, to me, makes the most sense. Yeah, for what it's worth. Well, Jay Davis wants to know if I can show how to build a two-year bond ladder. Well, I can show you a tool that I think we'll, we'll walk you through it. Yeah. And um, so here it is. This is on Fidelity's website. It doesn't, I don't think it really matters whether you have Fidelity account. I mean, you can still, well, to use the tool, but this sort of walks through how they work, right? And they give you examples. Now, this was a five-year, but the principle is the same. Um, you know, you buy a one, a two, and a three. When the one expires, you buy a three. That, that's in this example. It doesn't have to be exactly like this. Um, and then eventually you have these three-year bonds, three of them, that, that are maturing every year. You could have it mature every, for a two-year, maybe you have four different bonds that mature every six months, right? So the idea would be you might do a six-month six bond or CD, a 12-month, an 18-month, and a 24-month, right? When the six-month matures, you put it in a 24. And, and then when the next one matures, you do the same thing. So you end up with longer duration bonds or CDs, but they're maturing every whatever period you want, let's say six months. So you're getting the, the liquidity that you need every six months, um, but you're getting the presumably higher yield, it's not always the case, um, of the longer term bond or CD. And uh, they actually have a, a build a bond ladder. But I think this only, I think for this, you have to sign in, you do. So I don't know. I hope that helps. Um, so Aaron doesn't see the value in buying bonds, and I get that. Um, and certainly, if you've got many, many, many years before you need the money, an argument can be made that you don't need them. In or near retirement, I think they're critical um, because you simply can't afford a massive drawdown say like we had in the Great Depression, for example. And you might say, well, what are the odds of that happening? Yeah, they're not very good, but then do you wanna risk it? I generally don't like having money I'm gonna need over the next few years in equities anyway. So where am I gonna put it? Fixed income kind of makes sense, I think. And over, by the way, over fairly long periods of time, a 90-10 portfolio can actually outperform a 100% equity portfolio. But you know, the other thing is you know, what you can stomach. All right. One thing I wanted to mention, brokered CDs. So Fidelity, that's another good source. You go to, um, I'll show you the page. So these are CDs, but they're bought and sold in the secondary market, not unlike a bond. So you can sell this CD on the secondary market, right? And here, here's the page, brokered CD, and they walk through it. And here are their current yields as of today. Um, so not bad, right? 12 months. But you should, you should almost think of these like bonds in the sense that if you want to sell this bond, first of all, there has to be a market for it. Although I think with Fidelity, they make their own market, I think. Uh, but if rates have gone up, the, it's just like a bond. The value of the CD is going to go down. So you just have to bear that in mind. But, you know, here's one for 3%. It's not bad. Um, you know, all things considered, nine months, 285. Um, yeah.
So Bob wants to know, for a fund such as BND, how can I see the average yield? Well, you can see the current yield and you can see the fund's performance over time. So we can just go to Morningstar again, put it in. And you see two things here. This is the yield over the last 12 months, right here. <laughs> Let's see if that's what this says. The sum of an investment's total trailing 12-month interest and dividend payments. Obviously, this is a bond fund, so it'd be interest. Um, so what's this? This is the annualized yield. And you may say, well, wait a minute, Rob. Doesn't 12 months equal an annual, you know, a yearly thing? Yeah. But this is an annualized yield based only on the last 30 days. Or to be more precise, a 30-day period ending on the last day of the previous month. And so that explains why the SEC yield is so much higher than the 12-month yield, because interest rates have been going up. So that's the yield, two different ways to look at it. I would say this yield is probably more relevant, right? Um, and then you can see performance here, the performance tab. Year to date, we're off 8.72%. 8, 8 you know, there are the returns. So I hope, hope that answers your question. Lou says, I've recently started investing in Berkshire for the long term. Do you believe Berkshire can keep averaging 20% rate of return? I do not. No. I just don't think it's possible. It's far too big. Um, I, would not, I would not go into Berkshire expecting a 20% rate. And, and truthfully, I mean, what's their average? Let's see, Berkshire Hathaway. So we'll go to the website. It's really fancy, by the way. I could develop this website. Um, where are their letters? Here we go. Most recent. There it is. This is the per share market value of Berkshire since 1965. Yeah, it's up 20%. But no, I don't, I would not expect that to repeat itself. And Warren Buffett says the same thing, actually. Marie loves, loves my e-bike. What kind do you have? So I, like I told you, I, we were on the Trek Verve Plus 2, which is, I'll show you a picture of it. Yeah, that's basically it right there, more or less. And we were on a weird one that that was for two days. The third day we were on one. I forget the name of it now. Um, it was almost. I mean, you could pedal it, but it was almost like a moped more than more than an e bike. Okay. So Bingo knows wants to, wants to know about Fidelity's managed fitfolios. Well, I love the name. It's fun to say, Fidfolios. Uh, it's direct indexing. I do. I am planning a video on this. Not well, Fidfolios, but you know, Schwab has an offer now. Wealthfront's had one for a while. Um, the idea behind direct indexing is that rather than say invest in the S and P five hundred index, which is just you know one fund. You could invest in, in the individual companies that make up the S&P 500. And to mimic the returns and risk of the S&P 500, you don't actually have to invest in 500 companies. I think Wealthfront at one time used 100 or 120. I don't know about Fitfolios. I, I'll look into it. But the point is, you're investing in individual companies, some number of them, to sort of mimic an index. And you say, well... Why would I go to that trouble? I thought index funds were to make things cheaper and simpler. Why are we now complicating things? Well, the big idea, I think, is 
one potential advantage, I guess, is taxes, right? Even if the market is up, and say an S&P 500 index fund is up, some companies in that index are going to be down. And so if you've invested in individual companies, you can sell some companies that are, are losers, put, maybe take the money and put it in a comparable company that doesn't trigger wash sale. Um, in retirement, you could just, when you're taking money out, you could take money out based on specific companies and maybe that have the right tax consequences for you that year. Um, that's the theory. Uh, I think for the most part, there's another strategy where you would imagine being able to divide the S&P 500 between companies that pay a lot of dividends and companies that pay little. Putting the companies that pay little in dividends um, in a taxable account and the ones that pay a lot of dividends in a retirement account. You, you can't do that with just one index fund. Honestly, I'm not convinced it's worth the hassle. Um, in the case of Fidelity, and I think Schwab is the same, it's 40 basis points. Um, but there's another issue. You really need a taxable account to make sense of this. And once they divide that up, you're kind of stuck. I mean, what happens if five years from now you decide you don't want to do this? And they say, okay, well, we'll turn this account over to you. You've got 160 positions, most at a gain, let's say. I mean, now what do you do? So you're, in my mind, you're sort of locked in. I have started to do some research on direct indexing. And what I'm finding is that you, you might get some initial benefit, but unless you're making regular contributions or you have other investments that generate significant capital gains on an annual basis, the benefits of direct indexing tend to fade over time. So the long and short of it is I'm not convinced uh, that it's a good deal. At least for me. Well, Ben asked the question, looks like I got cut off. As a new investor, should I wait for? Ah, here we go. Do you think the market continues to dip? Michael Burry seems to think so. I have no idea. And, um, I know he predicted and, and bet on the housing crash and did very well and famous, and, um, but I just don't think it's a, a good long-term strategy. And in, in his case, I don't know, maybe he's pretty good at predicting these things, but it's his livelihood. He, that's what he does. That's all he thinks about. Well, as far as I can tell anyway. Actually, maybe he plays video games all day long. I don't know what he does, but I would not get too enamored with an investor because they they correctly predicted something at one point by the way it doesn't mean he's not a great investor but it's the whole prediction thing all right um i think if you're hiring an advisor and you're getting a lot of services i wouldn't say 40 basis points is too much it's a big expense and you need to calculate it but i, I do think it's too much I, I just don't see the the benefit from direct indexing to pay 40 40 basis points so i don't think the secret lab chair is worth the money for one thing it it's squeaky can you hear that you probably can it's probably driving you nuts so i may end up with a different chair but no, I probably wouldn't buy this again. And my son warned me. He said, don't buy it. He wanted me to get the, what is it? The Miller chair, what's it called? Miller chair, it's not what it's called. Um, Herman Miller, there we go. I don't know, they look so office-y though. That was a problem. Maybe they have better looking ones, right? They've got this guy. Let me show you. Why isn't it coming up? This, I don't know, it just looks too, like I'm back at the cubicle, back in the office. But it probably doesn't squeak, so it's got that going for it. Hmm. 
Hmm. How do I find aggressive growth? Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, you can find growth ETFs, right? Uh, it's not my approach to investing, but you could just search growth ETFs. You'll find lists of them. And Vanguard has a growth ETF, right? Vug. Um, I'll show you that one just because I know of it. We've talked about it. So it's very large cap, pretty significant growth tilt. So either all the valuation metrics are going to be high, right? I mean, you can find others, yeah. Just, just Google growth ETFs. You'll get a whole list of them. You can put them through Morningstar. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I, you know, um, now that you say this, Bizbo, aggressive growth is the old school term for small cap. I seem to recall reading somewhere that that's what Dave Ramsey means by that. But we're mixing terms because small cap can be growth or value. All right. Robert says, I saw your blog talking about Wealthfront. If I sign up with it, will I be bombarded by salesmen and brokers trying to sell me things since they can see my assets? I think you're talking about, whoops. I think you're talking about personal capital, not wealth front. Right? I think you are. Wealth front is a robo advisor, like Betterment. So the answer with personal capital is they'll reach out to you and offer to do a free portfolio analysis. You can do it or not do it. I've never done it. I told them no thank you. And I've been using it for, I think, since they launched it pretty much. Um, but they will, they will reach out to you and say, hey, you want to do this analysis or not? It's possible that they only reach out to people who connect accounts with a certain value. But I don't know that to be true. So I'm not really sure why I just said that. It came to my mind, and I spit it out. Jay Davis just bought BAT ETF. I have no idea what that is. Sometimes I like to guess BAT. Bloomberg, Barclays, Barclays, Alpha. I have no idea. I give up. Maybe... I don't know. Maybe it, 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 maybe, oh, bad ETF. It invests in companies related to baseball. No. Amplify Lithium and Battery Tech ETF. I would have never guessed that. And there it is. So I guess, is that a way to invest in the, the, the electric car kind of, um, Industry, maybe? I don't know. Let's see what it owns. I like learning about new funds. I don't invest in these things. These things meaning very specific sectors, generally. Well, Tesla. What's up with this percentage thing that now Morningstar is doing? That's not right. Isn't PYD the company that, that um, Buffett invested in? Maybe selling. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, so this, yeah, Rivian. Okay, well, there you go. I guess it's one way to get exposure to batteries. All right. Sometimes my chat, just to, see, I need a moderator. It jumps all over the place. It's still jumping. 
Okay. I think we're settling down. Oh, here's one. I get to win the lottery. Oh, and it's from YouTube. YouTube is watching. That's exciting. I guess. I'm not sure. Rob, if you win the lottery, literally or figuratively, why well, I, I, okay. If I have a choice, I'm thinking literally. And say you get 10 million, what would you do? I'd put it all into VTI and, I, and live off the 1.5% dividend. Yeah, I mean, so I would invest, if someone dropped $10 million in my lap, I would invest it the exact same way I invest our money now. The vast majority would go into low, low cost index funds. I'd probably keep some of it out for individual stocks because it's fun. Um, I'd give money to charity. That's what I do. No, no different. They could drop a hundred million in my lap. At some point, I could see maybe investing in in actual businesses, particularly if I thought it was a way um, to maybe do some good beyond just an investment, maybe. But I would have to have enough money so that I could have advisors, and I wouldn't have to do a lot of the the, the legwork. But yeah, short of that, it would, it would be the same way. That's the thing that people, people think that with a lot of money, whatever that is for you, you have to invest differently, like the wealthy invest differently. Well, I mean, again, the super wealthy, yeah, they might buy whole companies. Um, but, you know, a lot of very wealthy people invest very poorly. <laughs> they get really bad results. It's hard to beat a low-cost index fund approach. Yippee. Just like saying that name. Yippee and Fidfolios. Hi, Rob. In your opinion, which taxable allocation mutual fund is the best place to invest for the next 15 to 20 years? Three funds or a three-fund portfolio such as VTSAX, VTIX, and VBTLAX, which is if I'm remembering correctly, right? Total U.S. market, international, and bonds. These three, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, or if I did, if I've looked at them before, I forgot. So, F R G A X. So it's a fidelity growth allocation fund. That wouldn't suit me. I wouldn't. I personally don't tilt towards growth. That's just my own bias. And, I, and that means I lost out a bit in the last 10 years, right? Because although I did have Apple, which probably offset that, but um, VASGX, Vanguard Life Strategy Growth. So that's just, so that's Life Strategy Fund. Um, it's, an, it's what you call an asset allocation fund, and its portfolio is, allocation is, um, Roughly 80-20. So th that might be a good fund in and of itself, particularly in a retirement account. Oops, let me pull this up so you can see it. I want to keep the comment there, but uh, I don't know why. I, I guess you could invest in this and then it put some amount in FRGAX to tilt towards growth if that was your thing, maybe. I don't know. I guess I, you could do that. Paul Merriman kind of does that, not with growth, but like, he, you know, he's got a, a one portfolio I think he's recommended and He'll correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, like you could do a target date fund with within then add small cap value as like a, a second fund to tilt that way. I think he's recommended that or something similar at some point. And then Vanguard Wellington. So this is an odd. I don't know if you're suggesting all three of these, but it's kind of an odd collection of funds in my mind. A growth. A life strategy which sort of covers everything, and then Vanguard Wellington, which is a balanced fund that's 60-40. Kind of, I don't know. Seems a little hard to wrap my mind around that. It's not that, that it's a bad per se. I guess it depends how much you put in each, but you definitely want a tool to know what your asset allocation was, right? I mean, like Morningstar or Personal Capital, because it wouldn't be easy to figure that out just because these are all, well, not the first one, but... The second two are all sort of balanced funds. In my mind, personally, I would take the three fund portfolio approach 
That's just what I would do. Doesn't mean that this other one is wrong or bad, but it's kind of hard for me to wrap my mind around two balanced funds like that. I don't, I'm trying to think what would be the reason behind that. And I can't think of what the reason would be. Okay. I already answered YouTube, so he's he he or she or 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 Mr. YouTube or Mrs. YouTube. How about just YouTube has answered this question? The best way is to tag me. I should mention that at the top. So at Robert, because I see that lit up. And this is correct as well. So let me just let me see if I can show you guys what I this is not exactly what I'm looking at, but it'll give you an idea of what I'm up against. So uh, give me a second, I'll show you this. Okay, so this, this is not the screen I use, but this is what I would see behind the scenes. I use a different, a different tool, but I, I see the same chat. So here's the bat ETF question, right? You see that there? Uh, Oh, I didn't even see this. The ROM comic book number one on your shelf. I have that issue, which I bought back in 1979. Robert W. Nice. I had this same comic book years ago. I didn't buy it in 1979. I bought it in the 80s. And I ended up selling them when I went to law school. And I bought this one at a comic show a few years ago. Just to re relive the old, the, the past life. Okay, so my point is, so this is kind of where I am. I, I, see, I'm seeing things here like this didn't have my name. I skipped over it. Um, but this is kind of where I was as I go down. But look what I have, what's in the chat that I haven't even gotten to. I'm just scrolling, scrolling. Some people have tagged me, others have not. Scrolling, still scrolling. Yeah. So um, I'm doing the best I can. All right. Hmm. And, and sometimes I pick up comments that don't tag me, but I find them interesting. Like Hybrid Anomaly says, my 16-year-old just bought 3,000 into VGHCX and 500 into FXAIX, which I think is S&P or total market, right? I don't know what the first one is. FXAIX, whoops. Yeah, Fidelity 500. What's VGHCX? Oh, healthcare. All right. I'm thrilled. 16 year old putting that kind of money into starting to invest. It's excellent. Yeah, Kevin, that's my approach too. So, um, Sean, to my knowledge, there's no catch. Uh, I am working, by the way, on a more comprehensive list of no penalty CDs. That is the best that I've been able to find so far. It doesn't mean it's the best out there. I will tell you, I am really working hard. Let me move my water bottle. To come up with as, as comprehensive a list as I, as I can, I was doing some analysis. Like if you Google best high yield savings account, I know the best rate I can find on a high yield savings account that's available nationwide. No monthly fee. Most savings accounts don't have a monthly fee, but no monthly fee. And what was the other criteria? Oh, yeah, no limit. Like sometimes they'll have a teaser rate. You can earn 5%, but only on a thousand bucks. No limit to the amount of money you can put in. And of course, the FDIC insured. The highest rate I could find right now, I think, is Basque Bank at 2.02. .02, right. So that would make the Sally May no penalty better. But my point is this I then Googled best high yield savings account. And I looked through a couple of pages of search results from Google. The vast majority, and these are well-known big sites, you've all heard of them, didn't have it. Their best was much lower than that. There were a couple of sites that had it. I think on the first page out of 10 listings, there were three that had it. 
uh, which is kind of frustrating. And so I, from my site, I want to list them all. Um, but it, it does take a lot of work. <laughs> I won't kid you. And I am working on no penalty CDs. So many of you email me either when you find a great rate or a, a, a rate has gone up that you learn about. Please do. I love to get those emails. I like to get them for two reasons. One is, uh, obviously, if I learn of a new rate, I can add it to the page. But also, it allows me to test my own internal systems that I use to get notified when rates go up. Because I do have some tools that I use. And it helps me to, a lot of times I'll say, oh, yeah, I see that. And I, I knew that already. And that, that always makes me feel good that my systems are working. Anyway. But no, I don't think there's a catch. Every no penalty CD I've ever seen tell, it says you can take it out without penalty after seven days. And I'm guessing that's a regulatory requirement. I've never seen a no penalty CD that didn't say you got to keep it in there seven days, but after that you can take it out penalty free. Keep in mind that when you take it out, I, and I believe this is true of all of them, you take all of it out. It's not like a savings account. You can put a little in and more and take some out and take more out. It's all in and all out. Okay. That is true. I like to say a retired lawyer, but please don't hold that against me. The at sign is not working. Uh, I don't know. I would think if anyone could fix that, it would be YouTube. Hmm? You know what I'm saying? All right. Oh, this is funny. Jeff says, a big thank you. Finally convinced my family that three bucket st strategy is moronic because of the vi your video dismantling it. Apparently, you are more believable than I am. Sometimes you need a neutral third party. Uh, that's what I should have been, is a mediator. I could be a mediator. I could be an arbitrator. Eh, life is eh, too short. I don't know. I don't have time for that. Um, well, you know, also, I don't know which video you showed them, but Harold Avinsky, the the father of, of the bucket strategy says he's not a fan of the three bucket approach. By the way, if you're listening and you're using a three bucket approach and it's working for you, I'm not here to talk you out of it. Got it. Actually, if you put an underscore between Rob and Berger, I think it, it shows up in orange in the system I showed you a minute ago, this one right here. See, orange. I guess you don't have to put the underscore. It shows up orange. The system I'm using over here does not show up orange. And you might say, well, well, well Rob, then why are you using this other system? Because it also brings in comments from Facebook. And, and so, but, but I probably will go back next week and just use the regular one and just focus on YouTube comments because I don't think I get a lot from Facebook. Gary, um, so the question is, what do you think of the idea of a, of a married couple loading up on Series I bonds above the 10K limit by gifting bonds to each other and having them delivered in future years? So I'm not sure what you mean by gifting bonds to each other and having them delivered in future years. It, I don't know what that really means or how that works, if you can do it. But, but I do believe you can't really get around the 10K limit by trying to gift it, because I think they tie it to Social Security numbers but I could be wrong. Really, I should say that after every answer, but I could be wrong. I'm smiling because of all these comments about how to tag me in the uh, comment. This is an interesting question. Why not ladder three month CDs? You won't miss out if interest rates rise. Well, so the way a three month ladder would work is it, let's say you had four CDs. You got a three month, a six month, a nine month, and a one year today. And then three months from now, your, your first, your three month CD matures and you put that money in a one year. And then in six months, the second CD matures, you put that in a one year. And then after nine months, that one matures, you put that in a one year. And then, of course, when the year's up, your one year matures, you put that back in a one year. And now they're staggered 
every three months, um, you won't miss out if, if interest rates rise. Well, let's say you do that today. The Fed raises rates, what is it, on Wednesday? And on, by Friday, you could have done much better. You will have missed out. Now, over time, if interest rates continue to rise and your first CD matures and you put it into a new one, you're going to get the current rate. But you, you would miss out at least for a period, on all four of those CDs, right? Because rates went up after you bought them. Uh, by the way, I, I'm not suggesting a CD ladder is a bad thing to do. Um, but I guess what I am saying is I don't think there's any sort of, you know, m master approach that solves all of the possible downsides to bonds versus CDs, brokered CDs, no penalty CD, treasury bills. There's going to be scenarios where the strategy will work better than others and you know there's not going to be just i don't think there's just one surefire approach i guess that's or if there is i'm not i'm sorry to laugh but youtube really struggling with i mean I, i'm getting them all of course you probably left that comment like 30 minutes ago i'm that far behind all right oh here we go here's one that excludes china VEA. We were talking about that a while ago, right? Let's look at that. I think someone may have brought this up to me. So this is the Vanguard FTSE developed. So it's developed. I guess all developed would exclude China, right? The problem with this, or problem, but the reality is it excludes a lot of other things too, because it's a developed market. So it excludes emerging markets. And you might be okay with that. I mean, you just have to know that, right? Come down to country. See? Yeah, so I yeah, developed markets would would exclude China, but again, would exclude a lot of other things too. So Clark wants to know what I think about the business development company stocks for monthly income. I don't know what that means. Well, I know what monthly income means. Business development company stocks. Schwab, BDCs. What are BDCs? Business development companies are a special type of investment that combines attributes of publicly traded companies and closed-end investment vehicles, giving investors exposure to private equity or venture capital-like investments. Yeah, I'll have to read up on that. I don't, uh, this is what I'm looking at. If you want to, you just Google BDCs, you'll find the Schwab page. I need to dive into it. That's one that I don't have any experience with. But thanks for bringing it up, see? Now I can read that this week and I don't know, maybe it's a good thing. Well, we kind of talked about this. So Slim Dog wants to know if I've studied yield splitting, putting low yield growth investments in taxable and higher yield in retirement accounts. So this gets back to the direct indexing discussion, right? Um, I, 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 I suppose at one level I do that but at just the, the, the index fund or ETF level, so I don't do direct indexing or anything like that. Now, could there be other ways to do this that don't involve direct indexing? I don't know, but it's a good, it's a good question. I'll look that up too. Maybe there are different approaches to that. It's interesting, I just Googled yield splitting and I got a Michael Kitsis article from March of this year. He's great. He's going to be on the show August 5th, right? So this might, in my research, I would definitely start with this. His content's terrific. Now, he doesn't write all of these anymore, but they're still great. Yeah, so this one's a different author. Um, but he may just be talking about it from an asset location perspective. Um, and we talk about that a lot, right? So I don't know if, if, if that article goes beyond that. I'll check it out and let you know. So I haven't looked at the bid ask spread. I'm always concerned about it or, or make, make, you know, note it with an ETF, Dave. Um, one thing I've found is that the bid ask spread can be really out of whack at the opening 
and at the close of the market. So like now, if we looked at it, I don't even know if they reported after hours, they probably do. Let's take a look. I'm gonna tell you something about gold too and about advertisers for this show. I turned down, I turned down the vast majority of advertisers. I turned down one that I wanna tell you about. So like, if you look at this, here's the bid ask spread right now. This is on Morningstar, right? AVUV, and it's huge. That's huge. I mean, it should be, it should be a couple of pennies, right? My hunch though, and I'm gonna make a point to look at this tomorrow. If you look at this at say, after 10 a.m. tomorrow, Eastern time, I am going to guess that this is down to a couple of pennies or very, very small. It should not be 5.76%. Um, you know, I'm curious, like let's do a VTI. Uh, of course I could be wrong, maybe that's normal and, and that would be an issue, but I'd just be stunned if that's the case. So even this one for VTI, half a percent, it's pretty significant. I'm gonna guess this narrows tomorrow after the market's open. Yeah, we'll find out. Oh yeah, so I, um, a company reached out to me that offers gold IRAs. They open up, you know, they help you open up a basically self-directed IRA and you buy physical gold. They'll hold it for you. And um, I, may, I may have told this story, I don't know. And I, you know, I was debating, well, I know I talked about gold IRAs at one point just briefly, but I, I'm thinking, well, this isn't something I believe in. I don't think gold is generally a good investment. If someone, but then I think, you know, if someone wants to own a couple percent, it's not the end of the world. And if they want to do it and I can find a good place for them to do it, why not? But then I started talking to them and they were saying, you know, your commission, the, the, my fee, like if you clicked on a link, and went to the, I'm not going to tell you the company name, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, I get a commission that depending on how much you invest and what, what specifically you buy, my commission could be 50 grand or more on a single transaction. Now, let me just tell you right now, affiliate marketing, you know, you open up a bank account and, and if it's an advertiser, you're, you're talking, you know, somewhere between 20 and maybe $150, depending on the bank or the credit card, or there are some that are a little higher, but 50,000 is insane. And I said to him, I said, I, well, wait, wait a minute. If you can pay me 50 grand on a single transaction, I admit it, you know, this is someone putting a lot of money and think a million dollars or something, but still, what are your spreads? And for the, for the ones that would really pay, you're talking about like 33%. And I just said, yeah, you know, I said, yeah, okay, appreciate it. I'll think about it. I never got back to him. I, how can you recommend that? I can't recommend that. Even for one or 2% of your portfolio, there's just no way I can do that. My test is if my mom's listening to the show, hi mom, if you're listening, if she, bought some financial product that I mentioned, whether they're an advertiser or not. How would I feel about that? Would I be, that's a good, solid move, mom. I'm glad you did that. Or would I be, Ugh, you did what? And for that one, it would definitely be, Ugh, what, what'd you do? So they're out. That's kind of how I think about it. So anyway, that was a spread, that was a big spread, but these are gonna come down, I think, when we look at them during the market, I think. Dan says that Mag Magnus e-bikes, never heard of them, which shouldn't be surprising. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, that's not it. Well, in any event. By the way, tomorrow I'm riding for, for the first time in a long time on my, I just have a road bike, you know, not just all powered by me, <laughs> which is why it goes so slowly. Okay. Huh. BDC companies loan money to companies that banks won't touch. Do you like that business model? That business model may be great, but as an investor, it, it strikes me as a lot of work to understand the real risks 
I'm not sure it'd be something I'd jump into. Well, this is good to know. It is Lake George. Just finished a week there in Burlington equals Switchback Brewery. Mm. All right. We did have Ben and Jerry's. I don't know if Ben and Jerry's in Burlington is better than elsewhere, but oh, it was good. I got chocolate, which I always get, but then I got a scoop of some sort of coffee with something in it. I think espresso something. Ooh, it's delicious. Is it 8.30? It's 8.30. Time's up. Man, this hour and a half goes by fast. I would do it longer, but I, I'm exhausted at the end of these things. I am going to look at this comment from King Ming. Since someone brought a fundraise, I recently took all of my funds out of out of it and put them in, uh, I guess, ticker O, um, the monthly income fund, right? Then that's their motto. It's a great, it's been a great read, no question about it. Um, why is it that I Google it and it's realty income? But the, the website doesn't come up. That seems odd. Here we go. Here it is. You know, they invest in, um, like, real estate that, like, you know, CVS would be in or Walgreens or that kind of thing. Here, well, here we go. Portfolio. They've done incredibly well. Um, but it, it is like investing in, it is investing in, in, in an individual stock, right? Doesn't mean it's bad. Oh, well, there's CVS right there. You know, they've, they've got a great track record. I'm just going to skim through and, and in the last couple of minutes. Anonymous dude, one, two, three. You're welcome. Um, passive wants to know about tax loss harvesting. So you should get um, statements at the end of the year that show your gains and losses. And those get, get I'm 99.9% .9 sure, the betterments of the world send those to the IRS as well. Um, but you'll have those. I don't know, you don't attach those to your tax return, I don't think, right? Um, but you would have those to show it, like if you ever got audited. Um, but again, I'm not a tax person. I pay someone to do our taxes. Someone said something about Ben Miller, but I don't know who that is or what they said. Okay. I feel like there's a whole sort of sub-community of comments that go on while the show's going, which is great, but that I'm just not a part of. I feel kind of left out. At first, I thought that was a typo, the Burger Heads convention. Would you guys come to a convention? We had a meetup. I should do a, a poll. Create a poll. Would you attend a, and I wouldn't call it Burger Heads. I'm going to tell you that right now. I don't know what I'd call it, but it ain't going to be that. A Burger Heads con convention conference in DC? Question mark. Yes and no. Did that work? There it is. Take the poll. What would we do? I don't know. So Harry wants to know if ETFs are riskier than index funds in terms of liquidity. They can be. Depends on the ETF. 
you know, the kind of ETFs we talk about on this show, like, you know, think of Vanguard Total Market, like a VTI, they're very heavily traded. I, you know, I can't say that there would never be a, a liquidity issue, but it seems less likely to me. And also, you know, how quickly are you going to need the money if this is sort of long term buy and hold investing? But it, you know, you know, I mean, it could be. There are some ETFs that are thinly traded. Well, Fabiano, I, I get that, but it's a discount to what? So, yeah, the market may be down 20%, for example. That doesn't mean it won't go down further. It do also doesn't mean that, that, that assets are, are fairly valued. They could still over, be overvalued, right? I mean, if you're just dollar cost averaging every month into a 401k or IRA, taxable accounts, I just keep doing that. Doesn't matter. But if you're truly thinking about valuation, um, what the price was a week ago is irrelevant. I mean, certainly if it's down, you'd prefer to buy lower than higher. But the fact that something is lower today doesn't make it a good deal. Right. How are we doing? So on the poll, it's split 50-50, I think, more or less. Why can't I see this thing? Here we go. 82 votes. That means about 40 of you would, would come. Interesting. We, we got to think this through. I don't know. How, what would that look like? I guess we'd have speakers. I wonder who would come to speak. Who would you want to, to attend? That'd be the question. Well, Michael, the, the five-year thing concerns me. That's not a very long time. Um, I mean, I would just do a three-fund portfolio generally, but for five years, that could be risky. That's a tricky time period to invest. Um, you still could do like a total U.S. market international bond fund, perhaps. But your the real question to me, the tough question, isn't which three funds. It's what's your allocation going to be? And how's it going to change over that five-year period? It's not a very long period of time. And why five years? What happens in five years? What are you going to do with the 500K? Uh, that, those are sort of the questions I would be asking. All right, gang, I am going to call it a night. I don't mind thinking more about this convention. We'd have to figure out a name because I refuse to use burger heads. <laughs> um, and then like, what would it look like? Who would be there? I guess we'd have to have speakers. I don't know. I don't know much about running a convention. If any of you have run conventions and you want to help me, I mean, I'm open to it. Maybe thinking, you know, sometime next year. Yeah. Huh, I'll have to think about it. All right. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Uh, this makes more sense to me from James. The 30-day median bid-ask spread of AVUV is just four basis points. I, 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 and so appreciate that, James. Um, that, that makes a lot more sense to me. So again, check it out tomorrow at 10 a.m. It, it won't be what you see now. Shouldn't be. Yeah. All right, gang. I will have more videos this week, uh, hopefully. As of now, we won't have a show next week, but I'll be back the week after. It's a summer thing, you know. And uh, uh, so that's the deal. Have a great week. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. See ya.